Ladies and gentlemen, uh, director David Leach and producer Kelly McCormick. Be careful getting on. Whatever you want to do. Here we go. Yeah. First stunt of the night. <laughs> Got it? This is what stunt coordinators really do is they make sure that you're safe. He's like the safest guy around. <laughs> How's everybody? Uh, hey. So I want to give, to start things off, I want to give a huge thank you to IMAX and to Sony for letting us do the screening and to you guys for coming out. For people that don't realize, they flew in for, what, are you guys here for just a few days? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we have to head back to Sydney soon. So right. yeah, Friday. But yeah, just a few days for the junket and stuff. Yeah, they are. Um, so we got very lucky getting them. They're going to do The Fall Guy with Ryan Gosling in Sydney after this. Yeah. 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 Starting in October. So um, jumping into, uh, how did you guys actually decide that this was going to be the next project? Oh, Kelly? <laughs> well, we were looking for something that um, we could, you know, we had like the film business had the opportunity to go back to work sooner than a lot of industries did, for better or worse, um, <laughs> uh, and considered non or as an essential industry. Yeah, we were essential workers <laughs> at that time, at the height of the pandemic. So, and we really wanted to get our film family back together, and we thought, you know, it would be great if we could find some contained project that. Um, allowed for us to, you know, get going sooner, actually, and safer, to be honest, because it was actually, we started before the vaccine um, came into play. So we were figuring out a lot of the rules and regulations to keep people safe along the way. So we thought that that was a really good sort of idea to do that. And then this script comes across our desk right around the same time. And um, it happens to be perfectly contained and also gonzo and awesome. <laughs> I read it first and sort of forced David into doing it. Not at all. <laughs> no, it was, I, I mean, it was like gunpoint, but it was not at all. No, we, it was like a challenge because we saw all these crazy characters and it was like, how are you going to service seven stories? And um, we had a lot of conversations about like, how are we going to, first of all, logistically, like she was saying, we're going to make it on a stage at Sony. That sounded great. And then you start to really analyze the protocols and then you're like, yeah, but we're on a sound stage where we can contain everybody. We're also in a tube where we're right next to each other. So it was also had its problems with COVID. Um, but film crews figured that stuff out. And we found great protocols, great ventilation. We made the sets modular, all those things. But back to why we did it. And, and didn't miss a day, which a lot of people were shutting down for long periods of time at that point. And our COVID specialist told us it was because we had a really old crew <laughs> yeah she's like none super of the, boring and really old <laughs> none of the crew was going out at night they were all just going home and like you know you know you know bubbling up with their families so, you know we weren't like rowdy i guess so uh, that's why we avoided covid <laughs> but no look it was great characters zach Olkowitz had really made the characters come to life from the book and we that was our entry point into it the script and then we went back and rediscovered the book and the great stuff that katoro saka had in it and um you know, it was really, it just made sense. It was really in our wheelhouse of stuff we love to do. For people that don't realize, you were Brad's stunt double for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and I, I definitely want to ask you, you, were, you worked as Brad's double on Fight Club, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Well, no, you go, if there's any... There was, well, it was really, he, he did. And they've talked about it a bunch on the junket. And there was one really cute thing that happened during our junket where Brad and a couple of the... Um, cast were talking about stunt movies and if you know uh, you know and and they just brought up out of the blue like oh you know that thing in Born Ultimatum where the guy runs through all the windows and he's like chasing and you know the camera's chasing him and he jumps and all this stuff and I was like yeah I, was I go yeah that was David Leach and they're like no way <laughs> it was so cool I was like oh yeah that was your director <laughs> but <w> <laughs> So yeah, even with Brad, like on that, that first Fight Club movie was like a huge moment for me. I had been doing a lot of television, Buffy the Vampire Slayer fans in here, anybody? <laughs> yeah, I wore a lot of prosthetic makeup. I was killed about 47 times <laughs> on those TV shows. But then I ended up, um, I got a chance to work on Fight Club as one of the sort of fight choreographer trainers. Um, David Fincher really wanted the actors to get in there and... Um, learn the physicality of fighting. There wasn't a lot of fights in that movie, right? But it was more of like, he wanted the intention from those guys. So we were training Brad and they're like, you know, we need a double. 
and was standing next to him and they're just all like, what about him? Yeah, he'd be great. And then, wow, you know. He was a lot skinnier then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ouch. I was. <laughs> but five movies later, we, we, you know, we went on a run. We did Mr. and Mrs. Smith. We did Troy. Um, and we had you know, great times around the world doing really cool, big movies. So. The Mexican. Great story. The Mexican, story. yeah, great story. Well, what I'm curious about is everyone in Hollywood is looking to cast Brad in a movie. He is he gets sent every script in town and it's basically, you know, he, he gets offered everything. So do you think did your history uh, give you the leg up to getting him in this movie? Had you been talking about, you know, working together for a while? We had, you know, we um, I was really um, humbled to find out like he'd been watching you know, my career since the, I started to move into second unit directing and directing. And obviously, John Wick, Atomic Blonde, he knew those things. We reunited on Deadpool 2 for that cameo. And he was like, um, you know, he was a f huge fan of the first film. And he was also a fan of Ryan's. And so to get him to do that, we got to reunite again. And um, he was just starting to see me as a filmmaker. So, yeah, then it was a touch point like, hey, we, we should find something. Well, he also sent a spy in. Because uh, during the Hobbs and Shaw reshoots, he has this old time, um, I mean, since the beginning of time, I should say, uh, ma makeup artist named Jeannie Black, who's like amazing, and David and she were friends back in the day, too. And um, she came in and did re Jason's makeup on our reshoots. For and Hobbs and Shaw. She's usually not available. She does Julia Roberts. She does all these people. She's always busy. And she came and she's, she says, I'm spying. I got to see if Leach has got it. I think he might. <laughs> and so I really think she had something to do with it as well. Yeah. Jeannie, we've always been close. I mean, because again, like that time, he's, she's been with him forever. And um, for sure, I think she definitely, if she puts in a word, it means something in his world. And um yeah, she, we had a blast on Hobbs and Shaw, and I think she saw the, the way I run a set and the way I work with actors and that, that Brad might like that experience. But ultimately, I think it came to the material, and you know, if you get a chance to ask him, and he's been talking about it in the tour, it's like he really responded to the script too, and he is a material-first guy, and he loved the characters, and he loved sort of the irreverent idea of what this movie could be and try to make something fresh and original, and that was why he responded. I'm going to throw a curveball right now. Uh, I meant to ask this at the beginning. If you guys, and listen, obviously people want to be in business with you guys. You, you've, been pretty, you've been on a roll with films. But is there, if you could get the financing or the IP to do anything, what would you make and why? It's hard. I mean, look, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dodge this question. But I'll, then I'll answer it. I think um, what's been really fun with Bullet Train is like having a, now a chance to express myself outside of like two different franchises or franchise expansions or whatever you want to call Hobbs and Shaw like those were really great experiences with great people and um, put different creative constraints on me as an as a storyteller but also um, you know gave me resources I never would have if I wasn't in that space but Bullet Train was so fun because the IP was relatively unknown obviously here and we got to do something that was really original so Finding those ideas and, and um, really getting to express yourself is like what's interesting to me. Um, but I do have like, there's a lot of IPs that are out there and that I've always wanted to do. Um, and I've circled some in the past and I've attached to some and they fell out and like, and I would just hate to soil their names because I'd hope they come back again. <laughs> like, I don't want to, I don't want to. Dangle them out there to the universe and be like, God, I wish I could do that because, you know, maybe they'll come. Uh, but Kelly, there are. There's stuff. Kelly, do you want to answer? Uh, no, I abstain. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, there's too much pressure and there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's so many amazing stories to tell and some to retell. And, you know, it's it. And I, I just kind of believe that, like, you know, I sort of we don't really do that five year plan thing. We just sort of like look at some things that really sing to us in the moment and try to go with that. And um, so far, we've been really lucky that way with with both, I, you know, known IP and franchise and then also originals as well. So you touched you touched on it a little bit. But I think that to be very clear for people that don't realize, like 96 percent of this movie was shot on the Sony backlot on a soundstage. 
So um, uh, talk a little bit about how using technology to help tell this story, was it, you know, I, I believe I read that you were using old school projection with new tech LED. I mean, can you sort of take us through, like, how did you pull it off doing all of this on the back, you know, on a soundstage? Yeah, I'll, I'll get into it. I mean, that was part of the problem opportunity. I'm, I'm by nature, I think my years of being a second unit director, I am more of organic filmmaker. Like I want to go to the location and then I want to be inspired by the location and I want to shoot in that location and I want to bring the crew to that location. And so I don't, I'm not, the, the bringing me to a stage is kind of like the last thing I want, you know. Um, but we didn't have a choice, right? So it really was an opportunity for me to explore some of the new technology. Um, the first thing we explored was the um, the virtual production screens, you know, virtual, re virtual, um, uh, is it the, uh, like, the LED stuff or the, the LED, volume? The LED walls like they had in uh, Mandalorian, uh, Lux uh, Machina came and, you know, we worked with Unreal Engine. Um, ultimately, we found out we didn't need to track the cameras. I mean, the parallax wasn't, this is getting technical, but it wasn't so much that we felt like we had to track the camera with Unreal. So we were really just using the LED technology and we shot plates before production of the trip from Tokyo to Kyoto. And we augmented them because you can see it's a stylized version of Japan. But we did all that augmentation and adding the light and color correction and adding buildings and things. But we created this journey in 3D. And then we just projected it on the outside of the window. So every shot is like you're shooting on a train. You know, you never, uh, there's no comp, blue screen comps. Like that's all just in camera with rear screen projection, but the new version of that, which is LED monitors, right? Yeah, people got motion sickness because it was like, they really felt that they were on the train a lot. Yeah, there were actors that just didn't like it, and there were others that felt it was really immersive. I mean, the things that it gets you from a technical side is like you get a lot of interactive light and all the kicks off all the surfaces. Like, it's stuff you can't create in visual effects. That inter it, Or it's really difficult to create um, that type of interactive light without having light. And now you have a comp and the light. It's actually a pretty, pretty uh, spectacular tool. I think it worked too to the m movie itself in the sense that it's a heightened world. It's a fable. You know, when you first read it, it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to go to Japan and this is going to be amazing. And <laughs> that, I think that version wah, wah. is much more grounded, you know, naturally. And I think the movie for us is a fable. It's like... Um, you know, not supposed to, you're supposed to be taken away and go for, you know, all of the philosophical, you know, sojourns that are happening on the train. And um, I think that actually the, you know, being forced to shoot like in, you know, the LEDs and virtually allowed for you to really maximize that feeling um, of it being just heightened and not of this world kind of. For sure. I mean, it actually led us to a lot of the design of the movie in terms of like the color palette and the heightened style and even being in that environment with color palette heightened style heightened costumes it just the tone of the movie lifted when the characters came on set when the actors came on set and like you know we really felt that that mood change and we were in a live action anime sort of vibe that's what we were going for you have worked with your dp jonathan's is it sela sela my bad. Uh, you've worked with Jonathan on all your projects. So how did you ultimately first decide you wanted to work with Jonathan? And talk a little bit about working with him on this, on the color aesthetic, and what you were going for and what you wanted each car to look like. Um, first time I worked with Jonathan was one of my first second unit jobs. It was on a... Um, Midnight Meat Train. Midnight Meat Train. It was a horror movie with... Um, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper, yes, you got it. Um, and Yuhei Kitamura was the director who I absolutely love. And um, Jonathan was this incredible DP. He's really quiet. He's got, um, and he's very meticulous and he has great composition. And on that movie, I was just like fascinated with his choices of composition. And so it always stuck with me and we had a great relationship. Even though he wasn't my DP, he was the first unit DP. When Chad and I got the opportunity to direct John Wick, I said, we gotta call my friend. John Sella. And he's like, I don't know John Sella. Who's John Sella? And then I showed him <laughs> Midnight Meat Train. And then I showed him the Die Hard that he'd shot. And he's like, holy shit, we got to call Jonathan Sella. And Jonathan has this extensive, um, he's kind of um, a legend in the music video world. So he comes from a super stylized um, 
upbringing in cinematography. So we love to dabble in color and heightened color and cool composition and camera moves and, and we really have fun as that as part of our narrative toolbox. Uh, we often do a color palette for all the scenes from John Wick, Atomic Blonde, they've all had color wheels of like what we want the scenes to be and how it's gonna arc through the movie. And um, Bullet Train was no different, you know. We work closely with production designer David Schooneman, who's been on all of our films since Atomic Blonde, and it's sort of our color geek fest. We love it. Yeah, yeah I mean. <laughs> Maybe the next one will be more natural, we'll see. I think the, the um, to the second part of your question, I think one of David's trepidations entering the project at all was how he was going to entertain anyone for two and a half, two hours. To, uh, Anna, it's actually two hours. Good job. It's two hours. <laughs> I just made it. it was I think he said two and a half credits. when we started. It She's actually like it needs is to be, absolutely two hours. That's awesome. two hours. Um, that, uh, you know, how are we going to entertain them? They're going to be on a train the whole time. It's going to get, you know, really sort of tedious. And so it was critical to create worlds within each train and yeah. cr train car. And so, you know, hopefully you feel a lot different when you're in the um, economy car versus the first class car versus a lounge versus like, you know, and, and the, and Momomon, which is my favorite car. <laughs> and sometimes the action that's happening there or the emotion that's happening there fits for, within the, you know, vision of that car. And sometimes it's completely juxtaposed to it. But that was sort of really important to the design of the movie. Movie. You guys have Bad Bunny in the movie, and uh, uh, how good is that guy? How good was that guy? Well, come on, <laughs> my, Bad Bunny. What? What? <laughs> right. I, I, but the thing about it is, you couldn't have known. He's gotten even more popular since filming this movie. Kelly McCormick knew. Right. I didn't know. I didn't know. You totally knew. <laughs> That was her big idea. That was one of her many big ideas. I, I'm not. I'm, that was like a huge idea. Like I had this vision of this grizzled old um, the the wolf. Like he's had and he lost the love of his life. Like he'd been with for you know 20 years and like it was this old grizzled passion. And she's like, ah, you we need to like find the young passion. It's first love. Like that wolf's gonna be way more tragic. And I'm like, oh, who are you thinking? And she's like, had been talking to Mary Renew, great casting. Amazing, and legend, legend. Had said that Bad Bunny had done this stint on Narcos. And so Kelly's- And also his music videos, and also his songs. I mean, there's so much passion in all of it, and he performs so well, and like, it's just, he's just a natural performer, I think. And so I was like, I think we should go for him. Yeah, we got we we reached out. We got on a Zoom. Um, he read over the weekend, and he's a you know he's a rock star. But he read over the weekend, and he's like, "I don't get to work with Brad Pitt." I'm like, "Yeah, this could be really fun. Like, come on, let's do it." And he's like, "Okay, like, yeah." And he came um, like a consummate professional. I think a lot of those guys are. That's how they get so successful. I mean, his work ethic is off the charts, and. He came and trained with us for three weeks to work on the fighting, and then we had to shoot that whole, you know, this nonverbal, you know, story that I wanted to tell visually. I wanted to build up the expectation of this character and obviously rip the rug out. And um, so he was with us for three, four weeks. Yeah, actually, I think we had a COVID hiccup in the middle of it and had to switch some stuff around, so he had to come back. And he was, like, just absolutely in for it all, worked his booty off i mean he's such a pro we love that guy so much and we've gone to his concert since and we are the oldest people who go <laughs> <laughs> we are the oldest bad bunny fans but his concerts are awesome and he's they gonna be are in so amazing in november everybody, everybody knows goes. every word it's so cool uh i am curious though so you there's a lot of action in this movie obviously mm -hmm. uh talk a little bit about how early on before production begins are you like staging these sequences and working with stunt teams and can you sort of like take us through like how early are you doing all this bef you know i mean it depends on the movie i mean bullet train was its own animal i think um because of covid we had a lot less time to prep and luckily you know the f the scenes on this train were really in my wheelhouse it's like fighting stunts it's like things i've been doing for 30 years and so I had a lot of uh, ideas and I had the tone where I wanted to go. We were sort of like this uh, homage to Jackie and Buster Keaton and all of those fun physical um, comedy beats that we were trying to, we were trying to get. So um, I think we had eight weeks with the stunt team, which 
again, it's not a lot for a big stunt movie. Like, it really isn't a lot. Um, but again, it was really fight-based stuff. And so they were working in masks and the weird protocols that we had at that time. And everyone has to test every day. And it was just a weird... Because choreography is tactile. Like, it's like people in a room kicking and punching each other, trying stuff, choke this guy, that choke doesn't work, try this, you know, oh, where's the comedic moment, hands in the face, and all that stuff during COVID before the vaccine was all weird, even for stunt people. They're like, somebody tests positive and everyone was like freaking out, and um, so we took this, this was very methodical and, and very different. A, like a big movie, you know, these big action movies, and Tim would know, like, you do months of pre and you know, rehearsing with, you know, your stunt team, and they're on for, they can be on for, you know, three, four, or five months. Yeah, by the way, we're, we're talking about someone in the audience. Oh, sorry, I didn't yeah. know. Here's the well, I just roll out and shoot it. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, the other thing that was different about this is usually you're also, a lot of times you're shooting with the same character for, uh, you know, mul in this case, there were a lot of characters that came in and out or only had one big sequence. And so you that allowed you to actually prep for mm -hmm. here's I'm, me talking as a producer as budgetarily speaking like <laughs> it allowed you to prep a little bit shorter at the beginning of the movie yeah. because then when the actor would come in you would need a few days with that actor to get them primed for what they were to do with their scene as it was coming up so it was it was very episodic that way the yeah, movie is a bit episodic like um, the, the train the whole production train there the train is rolling literally figuratively down the track but you're only shooting these two actors those other actors are off they can be rehearsing the stunt team's on for the whole movie so they go to a different place and they so the your shooting time is often prep time yeah it's hard for a director because you're like what's going on where's that choreography i want to see that has it changed but you're trying to focus on the scene yeah. you try and get as much prep done as you can in the beginning of the movie but it, it, it undoubtedly keeps rolling downhill and you're prepping and shooting until the very end are and we are uh, but maybe it's just me <laughs> He just rolls out of bed and shoots. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who do you, I don't know if, and I apologize for not knowing, did you have a second unit director on this? Yeah, Greg Rementer, yeah. who was with us on Hobbs and Shaw as well. I was going to say, how, listen, you've obviously done second unit, and I would imagine, are you, do you consider yourself to be a micromanager, or do you consider yourself to be like, you know, I trust my second unit director, I don't, I, I'm good. I trust them, you know, I, I d totally trust them because we've already gone, it's generally the guys that second unit for me are usually from my fight world and they've been my, on my choreography team and we've done a lot of stunt viz already or pre-viz and we know what the sequence is so they're going to get the pieces we all agreed upon and if they, they get inspired and they shoot something else, you know, it's, I'm, I'm usually fine with it because they're guys that have, I've been working with for a long time. You know, there's other movies, you know, and Hobbs and Shaw, I had a really great opportunity to work with Simon Crane, and he did some great stuff in, a, in, in um, Scotland for a sequence in that. And so it's a very different thing on a big, massive movie like that when there's moving parts of like, you know, I have a splinter unit here and a second unit where I am, and then I have to send a unit away. Um, you just have to have trust in people and that they're, you know, had the right conversations and you get good stuff. Uh, I... Do you actually think a Hobbs and Shaw sequel will ever happen? I hope so. I mean, I think those guys together are awesome. I mean, I hope so. I um, I don't I don't. I'm looking at Kelly and I'm I'm trying to. Well, she's like, I don't want to bet on it. I don't know what the odds are. I mean, they're so busy. Everyone's so busy. Um, but man, I think people had a lot of fun, and those two guys together are fire for sure. Yeah. That's the the kids are saying fire. Fire. Yeah. I've heard at times that they're in development on something, but we haven't seen anything. Yeah, the biggest problem with, with Dwayne is, um, you know, what is he scheduled out for two years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he goes deep on his schedule, and he's got a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, and everyone in this room who's seen a Q&A with me knows that I like talking about the editing process because it's where it all comes together. Uh, which of your films actually changed the most in the editing room that in ways you were not expecting? Ooh. Atomic Blonde? Yeah, you think? I don't know. What were you going to say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> nobody changed a lot in editing, actually. Yeah, nobody Nobody actually. I mean, it's a film we produced, but that transformed during the edit. Can yeah. you... Yeah. 
can you is there a re, like a what yeah was there's it? one sequence that i could probably share about it so uh the director's cut um you know has ever, anybody seen it some people have seen it. Bob, o- Bob the, Odenkirk. Bo- the Bob Odenkirk one. So Fantastic. If, if you remember the opening of that movie where it's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, mon- you know, and it's like really the perpetual sort of like drone of our lives and how you miss the garbage and all the shit that happens all week. So that uh, w- actually D- David and I conceived of after the director's cut. Like, so not to take anything away from Ilya, because that movie he's crushed, but he was, you know, it was starting kind of where the movie starts after that was where it started, which is kind of like into the family stuff and getting to know the family as they go and all that kind of stuff. And the movie to us was like critical to understand that for, for us, the movie's about... Um, you know, that drone that people get into that, like, you know, you settle into this life, you, you know, thought you were going for the American dream. You don't really do it anymore. You kind of go to the humdrum. You haven't really figured it out. And then, you know, something triggers you that like shakes you out of that, like monotony and makes you kind of a better person (laughs) through violence (laughs) 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 awkwardly. But, um, no, but that was, you know, that, you couldn't get that sort of rhythm of like the regular life and the humdrum of like what we all go through when you watched it, you know, when we were sort of watching the director's cut. And so we pitched Ilya that idea and didn't do any additional photography. We just used the same footage to make yeah. it feel even more okay. monotonous. <laughs> and um, that cha- I thought changed the movie so significantly and made it really kind of really connecting in that way. Um, I, that to me was like one of the biggest things that we've Change. Yeah, you you make me think of something because the way you enter a movie is so crucial. Um, and I'll I don't know. I mean, it's one of the things that happened editorially with Bullet Train is that the original script was it told in character chapters for the first uh, two reels. So you'd meet a character, you go all the way back, and then you meet another group of characters, and you go all the way back and meet another group of characters, and you'd see them all walk past each other. And so the way we had shot it. You would always see the other characters in the other person's scene, but you'd stay with those characters. And we were just feeling the, we really wanted to get into the movie faster. We wanted to be with Ladybug sooner. We wanted this momentum to fall forward. They were also interconnected that Elizabeth, um, our, our editorial partner in crime who does all our movies, was like, we should intercut this stuff and like, just get on with it. You know, it's really cool how they pass each other and let's just go back and forth and people will follow the narrative and it's going to be great. So she took a stab at it because I was a little reluctant because I, I like the elegance of the chapters. But then once you see that change, it becomes undeniable. You're like, oh, that's the way the movie was supposed to be. And um, you find all that stuff in post. And that's what I really love about post. Like you can find just some magic things that you never thought would change your movie. Did you have a much longer, like, first cut? Did you end up with a lot of deleted scenes? There's not a lot of deleted scenes. There's a lot of deleted material. The scenes were really long. And um, I, this movie in particular, I allowed this sort of play of, of improv. Obviously, you can see Aaron Taylor Johnson, Brian Tyree Henry are just having fun. And, like, their their characters are really, they're into their characters. And they are... Um, you know, getting to the point, editorials helping us get to the point of those scenes because they can chew it up and it's funny and it's funny and it's funny and there's so many jokes and improvs on the cutting room floor and if you, at some point you just gotta like, okay, choose because I'm gonna choose this joke and move on. Um, but no, I think the scenes just through great compression on Elizabeth's part, there isn't many scenes that are gone, if any. No. I think they're all there. They're just the essence of what they need to be. So we're obviously in an IMAX theater, and uh, this is being released in IMAX. Can you sort of talk about uh, the actual format of IMAX, and have you considered um, shooting in the future uh, using you know IMAX cameras for like f- filming something in total? I think, I mean, the IMAX experience, I thought, I mean, I think this movie in specific works really, really well in IMAX. I think it's very, it's such a, there's so much going on. And then um, it's, there's, it's, you know, they worked really hard on the visual storytelling, you know, like when we spot checked uh, the movie in IMAX, we actually. We were sitting in here. 
Yeah, and we ended up watching the whole thing because it was just we were seeing things that you hadn't seen before. And um, like there's one moment, if you remember, where Lemon spots the, you know, the gun with the bobby, you know, hair bobble on it in the um, like uh, b- uh, backpack. And you don't see that as clearly on other screens. It's just so clear that like he's connecting those dots. And then, you know, you see him put it back in and use his other gun. And that can be a little confusing if like it's because it's all going so quite quickly. And you can just see it so much more clearly. It's just one example. I mean, I think there's you know, it, it in specific is doing a lot just without words and, and um, you know, the visuals that I think it is an incredible format for this film in particular. And, and I wouldn't have thought that, and you say that, and I wouldn't have thought about it that in the beginning because you always think of IMAX as like, oh, it's great for these beautiful landscapes and these big scopey shots. And when we sat in this room, I just thought how compelling it is for a movie like this that is actually a lot of great close-ups and all this intricate detail and things that you have to follow, but the large format works incredibly well for it. So um, it's expanding my mind, actually, having this play so well in IMAX to like, what can I use it for and um, what would be interesting in my storytelling to use it for. Well, the thing is, like, I, I look at what Jordan Peele just did with Nope, and I think about Nolan and what he's doing with the Oppenheimer and the other. Basically, uh, listen, I, I love IMAX. Obviously, I've been doing a screening series here for forever. And so, uh, you know, I like it when filmmaker, when I push filmmakers and being like, so do you think you're about to shoot Fall Guy? Any thought about IMAX? You put us on the spot here at IMAX. <laughs> right. I do this on purpose. I know, it would, I know. Actually, Fall Guy would look amazing in IMAX. It's going to have some epic stuff in it for sure. Yeah, and I think that type of movie, actually, now that you say it, Steve, and we're lends gonna shoot, itself. We're going to shoot Sydney for Sydney. I'm trying to talk you into it now, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's all locations. You know, it's really a location-driven movie. And um, we're going to be shooting practical locations, and we're going to be showing the city of Sydney. And, like, um, yeah, I call, mean. Call Peter Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, Here we go. L- l- listen, I, I personally... And I've said this so many times, I feel like, and by the way, I do not get paid by IMAX. This is just my love of the format, just to be very clear. Um, I just think it like you can't recreate it at home. Like you yeah. like, like I have a decent TV and a decent sound system. I cannot recreate the experience of going to a movie theater and being submerged in this. You know, it's it's fucking awesome. Sorry for my language. No, you're right. And I think it again, like as we look for as filmmakers to support formats that are gonna um you know, keep encouraging cinema to bounce back and, and to stay alive. And then this is definitely one of the premier formats for that stuff. So. Yeah. Hopefully you're leaving this theater with Kelly whispering in your ear, you know. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> Great. I, before I run out of time with you guys, though, um, because I, I know we're going to nearing the end, but like uh, you guys have 87 North. And I'm just curious what's coming up over there that you're really excited about. Um, this thing called Violent Night we shot in Winnipeg this winter, which is uh, David Harbour playing Santa, who has lost his Christmas spirit, and he has to beat up the naughty list to get his Christmas spirit back, as you do. <laughs> and it's really fun. It's really fun. Universal is going to release it around Christmas time. It's Tommy Workola directing, and um, just a hoot. It's ridiculous. It's so fun. Is it over the top violent or just violent? I think it's pretty. It's over the top violent. Like, is, What's is over the Bullet top Train violent over scene? the top violent? Yes. Maybe. It is. You guys saw Squid Game. Seriously? Have you I seen Squid Game? Ray, like, Squid Game? People, like, like, <laughs> we're watching Netflix Squid Game. The first people, the first episode, people are getting executed. And then, uh, you know, I have a few assassins die who are complicit on a train. And really naughty like, guys. Violence. Really naughty guys. Yeah, these people are like. Not that many guns. I mean, like. I was surprised when we got yeah. the response. Like, wow. Really? Hyper well, I, I, will, I will say that not everyone, even though Squid Game is super popular, not everyone has seen it. That It sounds like everyone's seen it. I, like, I have actually not seen Squid what? Game. What? You yeah. need to watch oh, Squid you gotta Game. You got to see Squid Game. Listen, it's so good. I, there's <laughs> wow. only so many hours in the day. I didn't do a junket. It's, uh, I know, it falls I know. through the cracks. Okay. But um, <laughs> but listen, with, but besides besides that, I know you guys are cooking up other stuff. And I know you opened like an office in Hollywood for training. Like, Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we did. We, um, you know, we didn't have an office before COVID. And then uh, when things 
uh, sort of felt like they were settling down. It was sort of like, let's all get back to work, <laughs> work. And the executives really wanted to. And we've always wanted to open another facility that's like, you know, sister to the one that uh, David and Chad share is down here in Inglewood. And so we were like, let's do something sister to it, like closer to where people live. <laughs> no, I, I love Inglewood. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but like, you know, in sort of Hollywood, sort of like more by where the studios are so that maybe they can use it as a training facility as well. And it was really hard to find a place. And then um, I was just looking around on, uh, you know, uh, Loop Net if you've heard of it and it's like this like uh you know place to look for like commercial spaces and there was this like church and i was like serious that had been converted um into this kind of modern looking space and completely just kind of renovated into just an openness with these beautiful windows and i just was like we got to go check this place out and then it ended up being available we ended up uh like converting it any even more putting a stunt floor in and a bunch of uh training equipment and our executives work out of there as well and people call it the church of pain it's <laughs> And it's really inspiring and also and kind of zen at the same time. <laughs> or it's like Ladybug. <laughs> spiritual, yeah. It's, it's it's a path to enlightenment. There, you can learn action, and uh, you know, but you can put peace out in the world too. It's still a church, you know. The yeah, from it's the pretty awesome. In. So, um, uh, talk a little bit though. Um, storyboarding versus finding it in the moment when you're on set. How much are you guys like prevising the entire thing, or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, for me, I work, the way I work with Jonathan is we shot list and we talk about the composition. Um, I do, when I use storyboards, it's for exploration. I mean, I have some great um, storyboard artists. One I've been working with recently, Will Groby, like since Deadpool, like I explore sequences from the script, like before pre-production starts but I can keep him on contract and I can workshop ideas and just say, sketch out this idea for me because it's one person that can give me some visuals. But once I get into production, for me, that starts to go away because I see the location, I know the set, I'm sitting there with Jonathan, we're gonna be here, we're gonna be there, we're gonna be a close up here, it's gonna be a 35 there, and we're just, we're shot listing. And it's very particular, it's like storyboards, but I don't feel like I need the boards anymore because I know, I see that the picture's already in my head if I have the words. So it's not, but it's very detailed. Like I don't, um, I, I like to start out like that. And then what happens ultimately is you have an actor come in and they have an input and you're like, oh, that's a better idea. And then part of that switches where you want to block something and then you adjust to that. But maybe 75% of it changes. But I'd love to have the plan just coming into the day. I got 20 setups. These are exactly what I want. And then if it changes, great. But I have a plan. I, I totally understand. Um, uh, I apologize for saying this, but I believe we have to stop this Q and A because you have to go somewhere. Oh, and I and uh, yeah. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions? Or yeah. 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 Oh. Do you want to open it up? Oh yeah, definitely. But I, um, yes, uh, we have a ball. Does anyone have any questions? Oh yeah. Um, let me give it to uh, Tim right there. Come on, Tim. Tim. Right. Oh, uh, well, shoot. We, wait, wait, no, no. We need the ball. Where's the ball? Where's, where's the <laughs> for people that don't realize, um, oh, just real quick, for, for people that don't know, uh, Tim directed the first Deadpool, and this guy directed the second Deadpool. <laughs> so it's a, it's a Deadpool family here. So cute. Wouldn't it exist without you, brother? You're very kind. Um, the, it was back to editorial again, because I wondered, because you were all in one location, because you had, I imagine, standing sets for all this, did it change the editorial process, like were you able to not have a, a lot of reshoots because you could go back and pick up little pieces? And it's really intricate with lots of little inserts to connective tissue, um, a, little, a beautiful little puzzle there. Did it help by um, having all that stuff? Did it change I, the process? Um, I like having standing I like having standing sets for that reason, like splinter unit, you know, or like um, you can go back. I think um, on every one of my films, it's always like the last day on stage is like um, mayhem. 17 <laughs> different pieces of set that are brought back out to the stage for an insert that I'm thinking I need. Um, we didn't have, did we do any additional photography on bullet no, train? No, we didn't do any. We didn't do any, any additional photography on bullet train, but we did have one of those days where it was like last day of school and get out the train cars, re, you know, 
make this feel like the bar car, make this feel like the, and, um, you know, put some smoke and some ashes here for the knife pickup. Like Brad, it Brad was in like 20 sets that day. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the fun thing about stage is like all the control you have and like to solve those problems and like, you know, a set can live and you're right. You don't have to go back to a location. And now you're just reminding me that I'm doing a location movie. Fuck. <laughs> I have to go back to all those places, Tim. I'll never get that shit. No reshoots with all that little intricate stuff. It's impressive. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, it went to the plan, and the plan sort of, w it worked. You know, we really, we planned. And we talked about reshoots for, actually, that's not true. That button with lemon is the one thing oh. we shot. Um, the, the we didn't even need it. It's Tom Rothman got all obsessed that we had to have lemon live again. <laughs> And so he was like, let's just go do this. And that's... We thought it, we were excited about it too. We're yeah, we excited. were yeah. super excited. It's so cute. Um, and, but yeah, that was the one thing we picked up, which is a coda. So yeah. Yeah. So I we went and shot that coda. Tom's idea. So who cares? Yeah. Right, you got it. He was like, he should live. We're like, that's a great idea. Will you pay for it? <laughs> I wish we could squeeze a few things in that we need. Then <laughs> I built a bunch of little sets and shot inserts. <laughs> uh, let's do another. Uh, do we have time for another question? Uh, do we? Right here? Yeah. Um, I just had a. Are you talking to? The, oh, we're talking. Okay. Uh, I just had a question. Um, first off, great movie. Probably one of the best I've seen all year. It's, oh, thank it's you so phenomenal. much. It's phenomenal. It's so great. Um, I saw that music was a big like deal within the action set pieces, and another movie that does that really, really well is Edgar Wright's Baby Driver, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. And I was wondering if like, did you have any inspiration from that, or like, like how important was music to you when it came to writing the sequence, fighting sequences, or just any of the scenes? Yeah, I, you know, music's always a, a big part of what I like to do. Uh, Atomic Blonde is like the perfect example. I mean, the soundtrack sort of drove the movie for me visually. And um, the soundtrack I wrote into the script and it really never changed. It was like in the DNA of that movie. So I do use it as a jumping off point. We have a great composer on this movie, uh, Dominic Lewis, who was super inspiring and he was creating suites of music for the characters before I started so I could, we could play them on set. And I was trying to find a um, sort of a needle drop vibe inside of, in the, in the score. So every song, if, even if it's a piece of score, it feels like a song that you may know or something from the past or different, er different types of music, but it felt like a song. And so that was our approach. And we created all these suites of material for our characters. And I played them and we'd start to identify them. And then he would refine them. And as we got into post, then we really refined it. Um, so yeah, we it was um, a long process. Yeah, there are actually are maybe fewer needle drops for David in this one than usual. And part of it was because just Dom was coming up with this amazing stuff, and we kept dropping needle <laughs> drops. It was like that was so much better than the idea. Yeah, that we the had. wolf. The, the, and, yeah. Yeah. the song for the wolf is an original piece by Dominic Lewis, and then we ended up getting an incredible artist to sing it, Alejandro Sanz, who's a, a, a Incredible Latin singer. He loved the song so much. He came on to re record it for himself. Um, we just, I don't know, it was like one of those fun creative explosions with Dom. Like he I don't created know if Engelbert hum Humperdinck sings, sings the um, bubbles in the 17 kills. That guy's like 82 years old. And he came in and recorded the music and he put like bananas behind his headphones <laughs> because it's the way he hears better. And he's just such a legend. He's still performing and like he's such a cool dude. And we had a lot of amazing singers come in for this one. It was pretty special. Yeah. Uh, can we do one more or... Are you, one more, one more. Um, that guy's raising his hand. Oh, you guys pick. Right here. Let's do it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> um, amazing film, by the way. Thank you. Uh, it's a very friends. simple question. Uh, I, just, I guess um, I wanted to know, both of you, uh, who are your favorite characters, and what was your favorite stunt achieved in this film? Wow. Who is yours? OK, OK, this is great. <laughs> this is great. OK, OK, OK. OK, <laughs> okay so I got I to gotta take ladybug you know what i'm saying he, i mean i have to take him out the way because he's like amazing so i'm gonna say uh i'm gonna say lemon that's yeah. my guy yeah, right lemon there. we have a big you know uh the, we have a lot of feels for lemon for sure um he uh is like this you know these two sociopaths come together and like they have this brotherhood and you obviously care about him it's so crazy like to be in a movie like that and then 
um, they give me these performances during their death scenes where I'm like actually feeling something. I'm like, holy crap. And like, I didn't want to undermine it. I wanted to just let you sit in it. Even though this is a bonkers, crazy, broad movie, I wanted you to feel those emotions with them because, you know, um, the journey's more satisfying. So uh, hats off to Brian and Aaron for their characters. Yeah, for sure. I think we love all the characters. It's really hard to pick. Um, and that was the hope is that somebody would connect to somebody in one of these characters in some way or maybe all of them in different re ways. And yeah. that's what we were really trying to do. The Elder's pretty cool, too. Hiroyuki, he's a Hiroyuki is a badass. He knows everything. Like. <laughs> um, on that note, I know you guys have to go to something else. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, uh, David and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys um, very much. Tell all your friends. Glad you got to see it. <laughs>